Welcome everyone. I'm Norman Wahlberger and we're here at the University of New South Wales. We're today going to have an introduction to homology. So the last few lectures we've been talking about the fundamental group of a surface or a space. This fundamental group is especially useful for low dimensional data. because it's basically concerning loops. Because it's all about loops. We might well ask, is there some kind of analog of that for higher dimensions, some kind of higher dimensional analog of studying loops? Well, there are. So there are higher dimensional analogs called uh, homotopy groups. Pi n of x for n uh, bigger than, well, bigger than uh, or equal to 2. And these are some kind of uh, generalization. So roughly speaking, for example, pi 2 is concerned with sort of two-dimensional loops, or maybe we might think of loops of loops. So you might have a loop, what does a loop of loop look like? Well, for example, if you have a sphere, for example, then you might start at a base point here, and you might think of a, a sort of a film of loops, one uh, getting bigger and bigger than this, and going all the way around and coming back to, uh, um, a loop at, at uh, the base point. So that loop of loops is somehow going all the way around the two-sphere, somehow capturing the two-dimensional hole in the sphere in a way that the fundamental group doesn't. So another way of thinking about it is to think in terms of maps from the square into space X, which have a certain uh, behavior on the, the boundary that sort of pins them down. Okay, so one can study these homotopy groups, but one finds that they are more complicated. So these are more complicated and difficult to compute. And in some sense, they turn out to be a little bit bizarre. So it turns out that when we look at the fundamental, the homotopy groups of the K sphere, the K dimensional sphere, its homotopy groups exist even if n is bigger than K. So, in some sense, there, this uh, somehow measuring higher dimensional holes in the K dimensional sphere. So, these exist and are quite uh, irregular and bizarre, let's say, almost. Rather interesting, but. Uh, So what we want is an alternative to homotopy groups, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So homology is a commutative alternative to homotopy. So for a topological space X, what we are going to do is we're going to cook up various groups called homology groups. H, N of X. These are going to be the homology groups going from N equals 0, 1, 2, and so on. And these are all going to be commutative groups. And in very loose sense, H sub n of x somehow measures the number of n-dimensional holes 
in X. The idea being that we can try to compute these things in a somewhat algorithmic computational way, even if we can't picture the space X or we have only a, a dim idea of what uh, n-dimensional holes might actually be. All right, so I'm going to start off by uh, looking at, uh, at an example. And uh, we're going to look at a, an example and some variants on it to introduce the ideas of homology in this lecture. So we will introduce the ideas via some examples. So here's our space X that we're going to consider. We're going to consider X, which is just a graph, at least to start with. And it's got uh, three vertices. Let's call them X, Y, and Z. And it's got a couple of edges, which we'll also direct. We'll call that one A, that one B, that one C. And we'll have another edge also going from, y to, from Z to X called D. Okay, so this is a graph, so it only has, has vertices x, y, and z, and edges a, b, c, and d. All right, so in some sense we can see that this graph has some kind of holes in it. It's got a hole sort of represented by this loop here. We can stick our finger through it. There's also another kind of a hole represented by uh, this loop here. So the loop, let's have a look at some loops here. The loop A, B, C starts at uh, X and ends at X. While the loop B, C, A, B, C, A starts and ends at Y and C, A, B starts and ends at Z. Now if we're going to work in the commutative setting and all of these are going to be essentially the same, then we can deduce that commutativity implies that it doesn't really matter where we start. So we are still going to be looking at loops that go around holes, but we are not going to look at these loops in exactly the same way as we did for the fundamental group. The fundamental group, we had a specified starting point. Here we're going to be a little bit more flexible. We want all of these to sort of represent the same, uh, the same loop. Another difference is that because we're working in a commutative setting, in commutative group theory, we prefer, generally, to write our operation additively. Right. So we're going to make that shift from a multiplicative notation like this to an additive notation. So also we prefer to write the operation or operations as addition in the commutative setting. So the loop will now be represented as by the expression A plus B plus C. And we'll agree that it doesn't matter uh, what order we take. That's the same as B plus C plus A equals A plus C plus B, etc. All right, this is an expression that actually represents going around. So we're going to call this particular kind of expression a cycle. So we call this expression a cycle 
because it physically represents going all the way around. Because it is a closed loop geometrically. Here's another cycle. Another cycle would be to go around another hole, say this one here. And let's choose a direction sort of to go around, but not necessarily a starting point. So this cycle can be expressed by the combination, well, we're going along C and then we're kind of going opposite to D, so we'll express it with the expression C minus D. Or another is well, the cycle that we get by going all the way around the outside. That's also a closed loop. And that cycle will be written as A plus B plus D. So these three cycles uh, represent sort of three different holes, but there's a relationship between them. The algebraic relation between these three cycles. So we're talking about A plus B plus C and C minus D and A plus B plus D. That each one represents some kind of hole. The first one represents that hole, the second one represents that hole, and the third one represents uh, that hole. Okay, the algebraic relation is uh, that uh, A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus D, that one, plus C minus D. Just algebraically, we're sort of working in a, in a group. This plus D and that minus D cancel, so we get A plus B plus C. So somehow A plus B plus C, we're thinking, is a combination of this cycle, A plus B plus D, together with this cycle, C minus D. All right, so what kind of arithmetic are we really doing here? Well, we're working in, in a group theoretical context. And let's try to be a little bit specific, a little bit more specific about what actually the objects are that we're, we're dealing with here. So let's let, say, C0 be the free abelian or free commutative group free abelian group on the vertices or generated by the vertices x, y, and z. And let's let C1 be the free abelian group on these directed edges. A, B, C, and D. So what does that mean? So elements of C0 are just integral combinations of X, Y, and Z. Are integral linear combinations of x, y, and z, such as, for example, 2x minus 3y plus 4z. We're allowed to make up any combinations as we want. That's an element in the free abelian group C0. And we're going to give them a name. We're going to call these things, we call these 
zero dimensional chains, or maybe just zero chains. Zero dimensional chains. So a chain is just going to be a word for a random element in this free abelian group, a random combination with integer coefficients of x, y, and z. Similarly, elements of C1 Well, they are integral linear combinations of our, our edges, A, B, C, and D, such as, <clears throat> well, such as maybe one of the cycles that we've already considered. For example, A plus B plus D. Or maybe something else which doesn't correspond to a cycle, like uh, 2a plus b minus 5c uh, plus 4d. We call these one-dimensional chains. All right, so at least now we have something that we can do our arithmetic with. We can talk about linear combinations of either vertices or edges, and we can combine them using just naive addition, uh, like we did over there, a plus b plus c equals a plus b plus d plus c minus d. Let's now ask the question, what do we mean by a cycle? algebraically. There's something different about a plus b plus d and some, some random one chain. We've seen that a plus b plus d corresponds to a loop in the graph. We want to express that looping closed behavior algebraically. So in other words, i.e. What's special about, uh, say, A plus B plus D, which is not shared by, by another example, 2A plus B minus 5C plus 4D. Well, so to answer that question, let's have another look at the graph. And let's have a look at the edges and the relationship between the edges and the vertices. So the answer is, uh, well, it depends on the relationship between edges and vertices. And we're going to express that relationship in terms of a boundary, talking about the boundary of an edge. All right, so each edge has a boundary. So boundaries are sort of crucial in homology. So what, for example, is the boundary? And the boundary well, typically would be denoted by del, this Greek letter del, uh, that will denote for us sort of boundary, boundary of something. So what's the boundary of A? Well, if A was an undirected edge, you'd just say, well, it's uh, x union y. But this edge A is actually directed. It goes from here to here. So we want to be a little bit more precise about what its boundary is. We'll say that the boundary of A is y minus x, reflecting the fact that the final point is y, the initial point is x. If this was like a vector in space. This would correspond to the expression for a vector, final minus initial. In a similar way, the boundary of B is z minus y. 
the boundary of C is X minus Z, and the boundary of D is, well, it's also X minus Z. So in general, the boundary of an edge is final point minus initial point. That's the rule. Okay, so we can think about this algebraically. But what we have here is a map that takes edges and gives us vertices, or rather combinations of vertices. Well, the combinations of vertices are what we're calling the zero chains, the elements of C0. So we're starting with something in C1. So delta is taking something in C1 and outputting something in C0. And since A, B, and C, and D are the generators for C1, this map extends to a group homomorphism. So delta from C1 to C0 is the group homomorphism which extends star. So let me be um, a little bit more precise about what that means. So here is delta applied to a general one chain. Suppose that the general one chain is alpha A plus beta B plus gamma C plus delta D. Delta not to be confused with this del. Okay, if it's a group homomorphism, then this should be alpha times del A plus beta del B plus gamma del C plus delta del D. So it's going to be alpha times, well, delta A, del A was Y minus X, del B was Z minus Y, That's a, that's a gamma, uh, plus gamma times del C, which is X minus Z, and plus delta times another X minus Z. So we're extending this homomorphism linearly. We're just talking about linear combinations, and it's probably good for you just to think in terms of this is a lot like linear algebra. Okay? The, the algebra that we're doing here is like linear algebra over the integers. And you can think of these things as being almost vectors, except that the coefficients always have to be integers and ra not uh, rational numbers or real numbers. All right, let's write this out a little bit more um, concretely in, a, in terms of the basis x, y, and z, if we group together how many of the various things we get, how many x's do we have? We have minus alpha plus a gamma plus delta number of x's. And the total number of y's that we get is alpha from here minus beta from here, and that's it. So alpha minus beta times y. How many z's? Uh, beta minus gamma minus delta. So, what did I say? How many z's? Yeah, beta minus gamma minus delta z. All right, now let's make a, an observation. Let's have a look at what the, this boundary operator does to A plus B plus C. But just a special case. So, well, the boundary of A, we said, was Y minus X. The boundary of B was Z minus Y. 
and the boundary of C is X minus Z. And so when we compute or simplify that in the group just generated by X, Y, and Z, we get the minus X cancels with that X, the Y cancels with that minus Y, that Z cancels with minus Z, we get zero. Which is exactly what we would expect because we're talking about a cycle. A plus B plus C. We're saying that the boundary of A is this minus this, the boundary of this is this minus this, and the boundary of this is this minus this. So if we add up the various boundaries, they all cancel and we get zero. That's going to be true for any cycle. Start final minus initial plus finest minus initial plus finest mi final minus initial. You go all the way around, by the time you get back, everything cancels. All the finals cancel with an initial. So this is an algebraic uh, way of detecting whether we have a cycle or not. If I write down some combination, I can define that to be a cycle when its del is zero. So let's do that. So definition. Definition. A chain, let's call it a T in C1, so a one-dimensional chain, is a cycle precisely when its boundary is zero. So let's ask the question, all right, in this case, what are all the cycles? Well, the typical element alpha A plus beta B plus gamma C plus delta D is a cycle precisely when its boundary is zero. Well, we've already computed what the boundary is. There are the coefficients there. So I'll write that out again. Minus alpha plus gamma plus delta has to be zero. And alpha minus beta has to be zero. That's the coefficient of y. And the coefficient of z was beta minus gamma minus delta. So we need these three conditions to be satisfied. And if they are, then we have a cycle. So natural question is, well, what are all the cycles then? What are all the possible solutions to this system of equations? All these numbers are integers. What are all the solutions? Well, from first year, we know how to solve a system of equations. So let's do that. This is a system of equation in four variables, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. We know that what to, to, to solve it, what we need to do is we need to write down an augmented matrix and row reduce that. Okay, so the augmented matrix for this is what? Well, the first equation is minus alpha plus zero beta plus gamma plus delta equals zero. The right hand side is just zero, so we'll ignore it. Then the next equation is alpha minus beta. So that's 1 minus 1, 0, 0, equals 0. And the third equation is beta, so no alphas, 1 beta minus alpha, minus gamma rather, and minus delta. <coughs> so that's the augmented matrix. In fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the null space of this matrix. This matrix is say uh, A, then what we're doing is we're trying to solve AX equals zero. In other words, we're finding the null space of this matrix. Then we'll have found all the cycles. Okay, how do we um, do such a thing? Well, we row reduce. So let's uh, move this around a little bit. So, going from here, standard procedure is to uh, let's say move things so we have a one up at the top. Maybe we'll do that. We'll change rows. Okay. 
Okay. And then with row reduce, we'll use this one here to get rid of this thing here below it. So that gives us one, minus one, zero, zero. And this plus this is zero, this plus this is minus one, this plus this is one, this plus this is one. And this one already has a zero, one, minus one, minus one in it. And then at the next stage, we could uh, go up here. We'll leave that first row where it is. We'll multiply this second row by uh, minus one, so that there's a one in the pivot position. And then this second and third row are essentially the same, so we've just, if we subtract one from the other, we're going to get a row of zeros. Not quite in fully reduced row echelon form. To get fully reduced row echelon form, we'll use this pivot to get rid of the entry above it. Okay, so we get one, we'll add the second row to the first row. Keep the second row where it is. Third row where it is. So we'll just add this row to the first one and giving us a zero, minus one, minus one. So it's now in fully reduced row echelon form. There are some pivot entries. That means that of our four variables, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, these ones here are parameters. Let's say, call the parameters R and S. So if we then solve in terms of those parameters, the first equation is alpha equals well, alpha minus r minus s equals zero, so alpha equals r plus s. The next one is beta equals, uh, same thing, r plus s. Gamma, we said, is equal to r, and delta is equal to s. So those are all the solutions. Let me write it in vector form. So another way of saying it is that alpha, beta, gamma, delta, this vector is r times the vector 1, 1, 1, 0, plus s times the vector 1, 1, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0, 1. telling us that the null space is two-dimensional and it's spanned by these two vectors. Okay? So this is, a vector of, this is a vector of solution, 1, 1, 1, 0. This is a, a solution and any linear combination is also a solution. So these two vectors form a basis for the null space of our matrix A. In other words, a base, they, they form a basis for the solutions or for the cycles. And what are these when we interpret back in our original framework? Well, we're talking about alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. We're talking about combinations here. So if these are all 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, then we're talking about the chain A plus B plus C. And the second one, 1, 1, 0, 1, corresponds to A, B, 0, C, and D. So it corresponds to A plus B plus D. So what we found is that these two cycles, these, these are cycles, and any other cycle is a linear combination of those. This forms a basis for the space of cycles. So in, uh, in sort of group theoretic language, uh, we had this map delta from C1 to C0. We've now established that we found that the kernel of this, this map, the things that get sent to zero, so that's what we're calling the cycles, that is 
the span of those two particular cycles. Uh, A plus B plus C and A plus B plus D. So in, in particular, this kernel, the cycles as a group, are isomorphic to Z plus Z. And this is our first homology group. Okay? So H1 of this space, let's call the space X. H1 of X is, now it's a space of cycles for now. So, so far it's cycles. Although later we'll, we'll modify this. The cycles here are uh, Z squared. All right, so that's, uh, that's our sort of our first example of a, a baby homology group where we're sort of counting the, the number of holes. So we see that algebraically this sort of has two holes corresponding the, to the, the, the two generators of this group. Not three holes as we first might have a guess because we might say, well, there are three loops. Yes, there are three loops, but there's a linear relationship between those loops. So the, the other loop, C minus D, is just already contained in this group because, of course, it's just the difference between these two. Right. So note that C minus D is cont obviously contained, is in uh, this kernel uh, too. It's just a linear, just uh, this one minus this one. All right, what would happen if we had a, a more general graph? So let's, let's look, a, look at a more general graph. So suppose our graph X is this one here. Okay, it doesn't have to be a planar graph, just a graph with a certain number of vertices, certain number of edges. Okay, so let's suppose that we have uh, V vertices and E edges. And a natural question might be, suppose we do the same thing that we just did over here and compute the cycles. How many cycles will we expect in such a graph? We're going to get more than just two independent cycles because this is a more complicated graph. So there's lots of cycles that you, we can kind of see. Uh, well, for example, well, just a triangle. So there's, there's a cycle. Or maybe this one. That's a cycle. We can imagine all kinds of cycles. When we go around something uh, three or four times, that would be a cycle as well. So the cycles form this group. How do we, how do we find this group? So the question is, what is, what is H1 of X? Well, we could do a linear algebra thing just like we did uh, in this question here. We could uh, label the vertices. We could give directions to the edges. We could set up the boundary operator. We could have a big augmented matrix, and then we could row reduce that matrix. And the, the number of vectors in the spanning uh, set for that null space would be then the, uh, the number of generating cycles. Okay, but that seems like a lot of work uh, for this graph, and if the graph is even bigger, it's 
it's a lot of linear algebra, so we'd like to think of some more clever way of thinking about that. And what we'll do is we'll make use of the following well-known theorem for, from graph theory that, well, it's almost obvious fact, every connected graph, say uh, X, has a spanning tree. Okay, what's that? That's a tree, which is a subgraph, which uses all the vertices, which passes through all the vertices, or which includes all the vertices. All right, there are many different uh, spanning trees. Let's find one. So let's uh, start here, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll use this vertex, and I'll, I'll make this edge. Okay, I'm going to make a tree that goes through all the vertices. It doesn't have to go through all the edges. It just needs to go through all the vertices. Okay. And this is a tree, so it means that we're not allowed to co go come back. There can be no circuits in this uh, graph. All right, we've got almost all the vertices. We still need this one, so we'll just include one more edge. Okay, so in red there, that's a, a spanning tree. T is a spanning tree. Okay. How many edges does this spanning tree have? Well, a tree with V vertices always has V minus one edges. Any tree In any tree, the, uh, the number of uh, edges is always one less than the number of vertices. Why is that? Well, because let's say we, we start with one of them, start with one of the vertices. Then every time you add an edge, you also add the final vertex. So if we pair this edge with that vertex, they get matched up. We pair this one with that vertex, this one with that vertex, this one with that vertex, this one with that vertex. Every time we add an edge, we're also adding a vertex. So they all end get, up, get paired up, except for the initial one that we start with. So there's always one more a vertex than edge. Okay. So we know the number of vertices. The number of vertices of this tree has to be the original number of vertices, namely V. And so we know the number of edges in this spanning tree. It's got to be v minus 1. And that means that, the number, that those edges that are not in the spanning tree, and therefore there are, well, altogether we said there were e edges. So there are e edges, e minus v minus 1 edges not included in the spanning tree. And of course, e minus v minus 1 is the same as e minus v plus 1. So that's the number of edges. e minus v plus 1 is the number of edges not in the spanning tree. And that would be, in this case, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It would be 5 edges not in the spanning tree. OK, so what happens? Well, it turns out that each of these edges, which is not in the spanning tree, gives us a cycle. How? Let's say we consider one such edge, say number two. Okay. So that edge, number two, once we add it to the spanning tree, we immediately get uh, 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 a cycle, namely this cycle right here. 
if we think about this edge, well, this edge is associated to this cycle. This edge is associated to this cycle. This edge is associated to this cycle. And uh, this edge is associated to this cycle. So every non-used edge gives us a cycle in the original graph. And these cycles are all sort of obviously independent because each one uses a different unused edge. So what ends up happening, and I've almost uh, proven this but not quite, is that the homology, the first homology of this graph is Z to the E minus V plus 1. There are that many generators for the homology, that many edges that we can uh, use to generate new cycles. So that's sort of the, the homology of a general graph. All right, but of course homology gets more interesting when we go beyond the one-dimensional case. So next time we're going to actually stick with this example here, but we're going to build some higher dimensional stuff on top of it by adding some two cells and three cells. And we're going to see how that changes the homology and that changes our, our understanding of what homology is. We have not yet defined homology properly. All right, so next time uh, we'll have a look at uh, what homology really is in the context still of a very specific example. So I'll see you then.